Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome. We are very pleased to welcome our friend David, David Witt, who has done talks for us in the past. Um, the last one he did was on Romania in, in the Adult Education College. We always look forward to seeing David's slides of his holidays. He's probably our one of our best traveled, most traveled friends. So we're really appreciative, David, of all the work that we know you've done in preparing this talk. And welcome to everybody, including those of you who'll be watching on YouTube. Okay, over to you, David. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's nice to be with you this morning. This feels a bit odd because I've never actually done a presentation before over Zoom. I've always been a, just a, a participant and I've never tried to show my photographs on Zoom. Um, the other new feature is the fact that during lockdown, I've been busy uh, digitizing all my slides, which totaled just over 27,000, uh, which kept me going for a few days. Um, and therefore, this is the first time I've tried to do a mixture of um, pictures which originally color slides and pictures which are, were always digital. Uh, hopefully, you won't see the join, but it'll be interesting to see what the, the feedback is. Um, my subject um, is the fascination of islands. Um, when I was uh, working on my slides, I realized how many different islands I'd been to and how they were intrinsically related to, uh, to holidays uh, and how they always seemed to uh, support all my um, interests, be it geology, history, uh, places of worship, unusual transport and wildlife. So I thought I'd put together a montage of pictures um, wandering around the world, looking at islands, um, none in any great detail, um, but all of them to try and uh, show you just one or two features of those islands and hopefully get people thinking about what uh, their memories as well. Um, so I'm starting off close to my home because I was brought up um, in Southampton. And so the Isle of Wight was a regular um, holiday destination for us, both for day trips and for uh, longer stays in the summer. Um, and it also was partly due to the island that I really started to find my fascination in um, geology and fossils and the like. Um, the, uh, the rocks of the, uh, the, uh, the Isle of Wight are made up of um, mainly chalks and clays from the Cretaceous period, which was the era when the dinosaurs both reached their zenith in terms of size and um, population, but also when the, there was the extinction at the end of that period. Um, not only the dinosaurs though, because about 80% of the whole extant species of plants and animals died out at the end of that period. Uh, due to some catastrophic uh, events, which I'll touch upon later in some of the other, other islands. Um, the railway system there has always uh, fascinated me as well because it's always been using second-hand equipment. Um, so we don't want to do. We'll, we'll start off, um, this is taken from the, um, the ferry going from uh, Lymington across to, the, uh, to Yarmouth on the Isle of Wight. It's the most peaceful way of crossing to the island because it's not so chaotic as Southampton to Cowes or Portsmouth to ride. Um, and sort of place where you, you, you drive up and they say, oh, park somewhere and just go and find a coffee and we'll call you when we want to put you on the boat. None of this queuing up in lanes or anything uh, organized. Um, well, Cowes itself um, has a, a chain ferry. Um, to carry vehicles and foot passengers across the Medina from East Cows to West Cows. Uh, this is a view of the chain ferry. Um, when I first visited the island, they were running these electric trains from Ride to Shanklin. Um, this, it, they were built um, in 1928 also, though some of the rolling stock was actually earlier than that, it was built in 1923. Um, and these were reformed into trains, which were ex-London transport um, from the Central and Piccadilly lines, um, formed into trains for the Isle of Wight. Um, and they started work there in 1967. Um, by 1989, 
the, the rolling stock was virtually falling apart. So they modernized and bought um, some ex London Transport 1938 stock from, from the Northern Line um, and again reformed them into smaller trains to, to run the service. Um, these uh, are now coming out of service and being replaced by um, another version of second-hand uh, London Transport trains, but I've not yet get, been to see them. Um, and of course, in earlier days when they had steam engines, the, um, they were second-hand as well. Um, here is a, um, a locomotive uh, it was on the island. It was Freshwater and W8, but um, was actually built as early as um, 1875 and moved to the island um, about 1920. And the final steam engines on the island were these uh, about 1929 and um, 30 two of the locos ended up on the island uh, at the peak. Moving northwards um, to Anglesey. The, the rocks of Anglesey are much older than um, the, uh, the Isle of Wight, um, known as the period of the Precambrian. This was the um, rocks of such an age that there are virtually no fossils in them at all because there was only very um, simple um, life on the planet at the time. Um, bridges are always uh, catch my attention. And this is the Britannia Tub Tubular Bridge, which was um, designed by George Stevenson to carry the Chester and Hollyhead Railway across from North Wales onto Anglesey. Um, it was rebuilt in the 1970s after a fire damaged the um, the tubes and it was then a road deck was put on on top of the um, the rail deck um, but uh, still quite a, a tasteful design and the, it shows all credit to the Victorian engineers they built to such standards that they could actually add extras to the bridge uh, and it could still carry all the weights needed um, now this is definitely the longest station name in Britain, usually abbreviated to Lanfair PG. Um, I will not try and pronounce it in its fullness. Uh, um, it's probably the longest station name in the world, but um, I've not been able to validate that statement. But uh, station is still open and used. Now, um, Continuing to the um, the Isle of Man, um, Irish legend has it that this was formed. The island was formed by a giant throwing rocks, which were taken from where Loch Ney um, in Northern Ireland now is. And if you sort of <laughs> compare the, the the rocks and the the, the shape of the of Loch Ney, it does actually uh, look plausible. But I don't think we had any giants. Um, again, it's a mecca for the transport enthusiast because it has all manner of ancient uh, delights. Um, it has the world's only remaining horse tramway along the uh, promenade. Um, and as you can see in this picture, taken in typical quality um, Isle of Man weather. It's got a steam railway. Um, three foot gauge. Um, this is um, locomotive number 11 Maitland um, at Port St Mary on the line from Douglas to uh, Port Erin. Um, again, the, all these locomotives are of the uh, of the era. Uh, they're all built for the island and most of the coaches are as well. So it's, it's quite a historic monument in its own right. And as befits an island, it is defended. And this is a uh, castle Russian. Uh, the, the, the fortification on the, um, the south side of the island.
There was also a, a miniature line, the, um, the Graudel Glen Railway. It was built to take visitors along the, um, the, the headlands from the, uh, the main road um, to, to Graudel Glen, um, where in times gone by, one of the inlets was fenced off and uh, housed polar bears and sea lions. Um, there are no polar bears or sea lions anymore, except that the fact that the two engines working the line are called polar bear and sea lion. It's a, a pleasant uh, ride, particularly on a, a summer's evening. The middle of the island is quite mountainous, and the highest peak on the island, of course, is Snaefell. And here is one of the, um, the trams climbing uh, the hill um, up to up to the summit from Laxey. Uh, sorry, bear with me a second. Oh, no power. Okay. All right. Um, And here you can see what one of the, uh, the trams at the summit. Uh, they are quite unique in that they, uh, the, uh, on the hilly section, the, the line has got a centre rail, uh, which is used for braking. So the, the tram has a, a device which grips the rail and the, um, the driver can grip it more tightly to, to slow down or release it slightly to, um, to speed up as necessary to keep his momentum coming down. The, at the northern end of the island, this is Point of Air. Uh, you can see how the, um, this is one of the effects of the changes in sea level, the way this uh, shingle bank is, is built up. Um, and in the distance, you can see the mainland. My next destination is um, the island of Islay, um, off the uh, west coast of Scotland. Believe it or not, this was actually a, um, a business trip. Um, I, I used to work for a wine, wine and spirit importer, and we had the agency for one of the um, malt whiskies, Brooklalic, uh, which, which is made on Islay. And as one of the senior managers of the company, I was invited for a weekend to stay at the distillery. Um, they left you a generous free sample to, to work through during the weekend and a chance to sort of spend two days uh, rambling around the island. Um, so the, um, the village of Brooklady, um didn't have much to, to view, so I walked to Port Charlotte, which is a a little fishing town and you may recognize that from the um the invite for this uh, meeting uh, be, i went in it was april and there weren't i don't think there's any tourists apart from myself on the island so all the locals stopped to chat and they wonder what what i was doing and uh, uh, where i was staying and did I know where, where to go and eat in the evening and whatnot? And all very, very sociable. And one of the problems about walking on the island, if you're walking on one of the roads, everyone would stop and say, do you want a lift? Uh, even if you were just wanting to go for a walk. Um, one of the features of the island is uh, the fact you can see various levels to the beach, um, known as raised beaches. This is due to a eustatic adjustment um, the, uh, the continents of the world and uh, sit on um, uh, rock plates which float on the magma of the, um, in, the, in the core of the, um, the earth. Now, when you have events such as um, the last ice age, the enormous weight of the ice on the, um, the European plate caused the, the land mass to sink and therefore sea level raised. Um, the, the effect of this was to cut
cut a different level of beach to the one that we um, see today. So you can see that the sort of the sandy beach, which is the current level, and then a, a shingle beach, which is higher up and no longer ever covered by sea. Um, you can see these levels at various points and it reflects the, uh, the changes in sea level resulting from the, um, the recent glaciations. So it just proves that things like climate change is nothing new, it's just this time man is uh, having a hand in it as well. And again you can sort of see different, some different levels of the, um, of the beach on that view. This is Loch Lindell. Uh, as is this, this was, this was basically the view from where I was staying, from over, very relaxed and quiet. Um, continuing uh, some Scottish islands, um, I've been to Iona a number of times, and um, obviously a, a, a very special place for, for many people, including myself. Um, the island, like Isla, shows evidence of these changes in sea level. Um, and on the way to um, Isla, you, you take the ferry from Oban to, to Mull, and this is Ladies Rock in the Firth of Lawn. And then on a nice day, as you take the ferry across from Mull to um, Iona, you get a, a rather splendid view of the, um, the Abbey. Um, again, a good view of the raised beach where you can see the sand level, which is the current, and then up the, the, the rocky um, small cliff, you can then see another flat level, which was where the sea level was um, during the height of the Ice Age. Um, people of Iona have a bit of a sense of humour. Um, obviously trying to entice you into the cafe rather than risk walking to the north end of the island where you you might meet up with Vikings. Oops, sorry. Um, I risked the Vikings and walked to the north end of the, of the island. Um, uh, so this is looking towards Elin Chalba. Um, uh, this is over on the west coast, on the bay at the back of the ocean. Um, again, more evidence of these different uh, levels of, uh, of beach uh, over the years. And I did go and explore, there's a, um, the rocks of um, Iona reflect the fact that uh, um, in very early history of the Earth, um, there was a lot of uh, volcanic activity in, in the area and it created various rocks, including marbles, which are as a result of a, of a rock being compressed by a very high pressure and also heated at the same time. Uh, so at one time, Iona was an important source of marble and the only evidence of any railway ever on the island was at the marble quarry. Oops. On my last trip there, one wet morning, a group of us, perhaps unwisely decided we were going to go to Staffa on the boat from Iona. Uh, we wondered why, as we got on the boat, we were handed these uh, very heavy uh, sou'westers. Once we got into the open sea, we realised why we got ex exceptionally wet. It was, it was raining and the, um, the sea was coming over the top of the boat. But it was a journey to, to savour. And, and as we approached Iona, 
sorry, a, a approach Daffer, um, you could start to see all this uh, famous Clumna uh, uh, basalt, which um, is so typical of the area. And here we are inside Fingal's cave. The, 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 the basalt um, with this hexagonal shaping, um, this is the result of the way the molten rock cooled evenly um, and therefore it contracted evenly in every direction and most of the main crystals in the rock are hexagonal, hence the, um, the, the allocation of that shape. So continuing um, our islands, let's move to the Baltic. Um, this is Rügen, which is uh, one of the German islands um, in the Baltic. Um, a popular destination for um, holiday makers. You wouldn't believe it that the Baltic that has actually um, got um, uh, sandy beaches and it attracts large numbers of people throughout the year. Um, so this is Cap Arcona, which is the on the, the northern coast of Rügen. And again there, likewise. And there we are, there is the sandy beach, which on a, a nice day um, you'll find uh, hundreds and hundreds of Germans um, sunning themselves behind the windbreaks tends to be quite windy there. Um, this was taken in January of uh, last year, which is why there are not many people on the beach. But the real reason we went there was um, the, the island has the remains of a very extensive narrow gauge railway system, um, which is now um, a, a tourist attraction. So moving to warmer climes to the Mediterranean, um, so Corsica. Um, so this island was formed initially um, back in the era of the what was known as Carboniferous and Devonian eras. Um, this is when the, uh, the tectonic plate, which uh, the continent of Africa was sitting on, um, moved rapidly northwards and hit into the um, the Pangaea plate, which held Europe and North America at the time. Um, this created all, all sorts of um, interesting rocks from the effect of uh, the heat and um, the pressures. And also uh, quite a lot of volcanic activity um, and magma rose up from the core of the earth to form granites. Um, then there, there's a subsequent collision in the Cretaceous, the end of the dinosaurs, which we touched on in the Isle of Wight, um, which created the Western Alps. And then Corsica as a tectonic plate split off and started to rotate through 45 degrees. It's these hard uh, granitic rocks and metamorphic rocks which um, form the rugged scenery of the, of the island. Um, we had a a fleeting visit here to ride on the train that uh, runs across the island. Um, so this is a uh, Calvi. Um, this is the. Uh, it, it, there's basically a, a service around the island between the main towns, but there's also a local shuttle, and this is it, um, which runs from Calvi to Ile Rus, which is um, a, a nice. Um, area of beaches. And that is Eel Moose. Calvi itself um, is full of these little alleyways and pathways and little cafes dotted around which you frequently have to stop for, for drinks because it's, it's certainly when we were there it was very very hot. Uh, its um, southern neighbour, Sardinia, uh, geologically one time was attached to Corsica, but the um, island is separated and now um, 
because of changes in the sea level in the Mediterranean. Um, yeah, they're definitely two distinct islands. Um, again, uh, it has its own network of narrow gauge railways. And when we visited, uh, a lot of the services were operated by steam engines. So this is um, the Harbour Arbor Tax. Um, this is the view from the train climbing out of um, Arbor Tax. You can see here the hazard of taking slides. You don't realise when you take a picture that uh, you've got a bit of a bush in the picture, but uh, it's, it's there and I've, so I've left it in, but I could have edited it out, but I thought it should be there. Um, and here we are at the uh, village of Searle. And the train continues to, to climb. After about um, two hours, the train in straight line distance has done about five miles. Whereas it's been so sort of slowly uh, winding its way up the hillside to gain height. Um, a feature of uh, the, the island are these Naragi stone towers. Um, they're the main megalithic edifice in Sardinia and they date from between 1900 and 730 BC. 7,000 different ones have been identified but they believe there may be as many as 10,000 on the island. And the archaeologists are totally unable to agree on the purpose of why all these were built. Uh, were they storehouses, defensive points? No one is really sure. Um, continuing towards the village of Macomba, this is uh, shows how the uh, the locals have found. Uh, flat places to build on in a country which is definitely not flat. Uh, this is Bossa Harbour. And then the uh, one of the vantage points to take photographs of trains in Sardinia. Um, this is south of Modolo on the um, on the west coast. Um, this is the village of Nilvi. Again. Uh, from the train, you can see the, the, the very uh, stony uh, scenery. This is near Templo on the um, northeast coast. You can see why the, this area gained the name the Emerald, Emerald Coast. Um, we took a boat trip um, out of the, the harbour at Palau, going towards Corsica, and some, see, and that's the typical rocky coastline showing the hard crystalline rocks which form much of Sardinia. Um, Moving now across to the Caribbean, um, Cuba. It's a long, thin island. The island is 1,250 kilometers long, in fact. Um, it's got a very complicated uh, geology because, um, again, it's the, the junction of these tectonic plates. Um, as you probably know, the, the Caribbean is prone to earthquakes and volcanic activity um, because of the movement of the plates. Um, 
this trip was primarily to see steam engines working in the um, the, the sugar mills, but uh, we also had a look at a few other things. And, and one relic of of the past is this um, electric interurban tramway, which runs from Matanzas to Casablanca, which is up on the outskirts of Havana. Uh, In Havana itself, this is the Hotel Nacional. Um, made famous by it well, in Hemingway's books. And the uh, Castillo de la Porte de la Punta in Havana. The coastline in Havana itself um, is not very attractive because uh, there's a lot of pollution. Uh, Havana or the Havana area has got a number of um, oil fields where the oil can be pumped and it's the crude is so thin that you don't actually need to refine it. It can actually be used for um, uh, things which use heavy oil, uh, diesel buses and uh, dare I say it, steam locomotives, but there's a lot of spillage and it all seems to end up on the beach. Anyway, that was really what we went to go and see, it was a, a lot of the sugar mills in the 1980s still used steam locomotives to bring the sugar cane in from the fields into the, the mill itself to be processed. Um, each mill was a sort of social unit in its own right, so it would have its own hospital, school, um, other facilities, so uh, all the workers and their families were well looked after. And here we see a couple of school children making their way home after a day's of, day of study. And this is the one of the loading points where the, um, the, 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 the raw cane is being loaded into the wagons and then the um, steam engines are coming out to collect the loaded wagons and they would return with empties for the uh, for, for more loading. Um, one feature of Cuban life in, in the 80s was that in the summer all the students and, and other people who had no other useful em employ would be sent out to help with the harvest. So they'd be picking the, the fruit and uh, helping in the fields. Uh, and there were these um, accommodation blocks dotted around in usually in the middle of nowhere where uh, workers would be accommodated for the, the period of the harvest. Um, the Cubans are highly skilled at uh, making, doing, mending things that probably most other uh, societies would scrap. So they've got a large number of ex-American cars. Obviously, they can't, cannot buy any spare parts for them, but they've managed to keep them all running and they often look quite immaculate. So they obviously take a lot of care over their cars. And, uh, wherever you went, you would see these... Uh, large uh, 1950s American cars. Um, a banana tree. Um, and this is one of the, uh, I would describe it as a rural scene near Simon Bolivar uh, sugar mill. You can just about pick out the, the rail track in the in the foreground, which is what we're actually doing, waiting to photograph a train. But typical of Cuban hospitality, um, there, there was a, a shack nearby and the uh, owner came out and invited us to go and sit on his veranda whilst we were waiting for the train rather than standing out in the sun, which is very nice of him. Um, The rural life is still very basic. Um, this is a farm near the um, sugar mill of Raphael Frere. 
if you ask any um, rail enthusiast who's been to Cuba about Rafael Frere, this is the go-to go place to see steam engines. They're very busy and lots of activity all day. And this is the typical um, scenery in the uh, Rafael Frere area. Cuba is a very popular destination for the sun seeker and it has got some beautiful unsport beaches away from Havana. This is Varadero, which is the um, a popular destination for Western tourists in, in normal times. Um, on the return to Havana, this was a visit to the San Cristobal Cathedral, which is also known as the Virgin of the Immaculate Conception. So a multi-purpose cathedral. And showing the, uh, the influence of the Spanish who colonized Cuba, uh, some of the old buildings have got a definite Spanish look to them. And finally, in Havana, the Castillo de la Furiza. Continuing our whistle stop tour of the world, we'll nip over the, the Americas and into the Pacific and stop off in the Galapagos Islands. There are no railways or other aspects of transport of great interest in the Galapagos, but if you're in that part of the world, who would not stop there to go and see the wildlife and the, uh, the geology? Um, we've talked about some very ancient rocks uh, in the world. The Galapagos is a very recent geological phenomenon. Um, and in, even in its geology, it's unique from the rest of the Pacific. The, if you look at the Pacific atolls, um, Hawaii and such like, which were very flat. Um, they are normally um, a, a basaltic rock uh, because the Pacific plate is a basalt plate. Um, and so the magma forming the volcanoes tends to be of, of that uh, chemistry. But the Galapagos um, are actually more granitic, which is actually suggesting that the where the lava is coming from is from underneath the South American plate. Um, one of the subjects we could discuss for hours, but uh, I, I shall get to a more fundamentals. Um, so the way to visit Galapagos is you uh, you fly in um, to um, the Isle of Santa Cruz, and then you uh, take um, a boat. Very very civilized and luxurious. Uh, we started off. Um, on a visit to North Seymour. So this is um, one of the small islets uh, on the way into North Seymour. And another one. Um, so this is a sea lion. The amazing thing about the uh, Galapagos is how close you get to the wildlife. They have no fear of man whatsoever. Um, so, um, I went armed with a, a ultra long focus lens and suddenly found it was, it was too, um, it was magnifying things too much. I had to take it off and put back my normal lens to take, take some of these photographs. Um, this is a blue fitted booby on the North Seymour. and a frigate bird. As you can see from the rock, this is a lava lizard. Uh, this is on Bartolome Island. This is typical scenery on one of the islands, which is, this is a uh, Isla Santiago.
and a brown pelican. Um, this is a Galapagos Mockingbird. It's a Darwin Bay on Tower Island. And a short-eared owl. Um, this is taken at Prince Philip Steps, also on Tower Island. Um, the Galapagos, quite rightly, are famous for their giant tortoises. Um, due to their, their virtually extinct, um, most of them are now sort of looked after at, in the Charles Darwin Research Centre on the Isla Santa Cruz. Um, but very beautiful animals for all that. Um, this is a Santa Fe Island, um, one of the lagoons. And a land iguana on Santa Fe Island. Despite their fearsome look, they're actually vegetarians, so um, they're, they're quite harmless. And a feature, you'll see all the fishermen going out um, to fish. That all of them have their um, pelican on board. Um, the, uh, it seems that a pelican will adopt the boat and uh, expect uh, to get some of the um, the rejects from, from the fishing. So this is at Puerto Ayora. Okay, continuing um, around the world. This is Hainan Island, um, which is the most southerly province of China. Um, again, very much in a volcanic origin. Um, Size-wise, it's very similar to the size of Taiwan, which we'll touch on later. And it's noted as the uh, holiday resort of Chairman Mao when he was alive. Um, we went there because it reputedly had some interesting um, steam trains, which it did, except they stopped running about a month before we arrived. But um, we saw uh, still uh, able to enjoy the um, the island and. We did see a few steam engines, but not what we were promised. Um, so, um, despite the, uh, the the communist or atheist viewpoint on Hainan Island, the, the temples seem to remain intact. And there is one of them. The agriculture is still pretty basic. Um, not the mechanisation that you perhaps see on the mainland. Um, it's an important fishing area, so uh, we see all the fishing boats tied up in the harbour at Sanya. And in addition to sort of the modern fishing boats, you still get the traditional sampans being used both as means of transport for people and um, small goods. Another view of the harbour. So this is what has happened in the between the the tour company planning our visit and actually took us arriving, they'd removed some of the steam engines, replaced them with um, more modern diesels. Uh, there we are. Um, so there's a daily train service from the town of Sanya to Dongfang, which is the administrative centre. Um, Quite actually, the, the, the actual engine inside the locomotive um, 
it's a Chinese copy of a Russian engine, which was copied um, from an American design, all, all the copies being unlicensed. So it's like we're photocopying your photocopy. Typical village scene photographed from the train. Um, the local authorities did not like us being there and did not like us using our cameras. So um, photographing anything, you had to be a little discreet about what you were doing. This is a Dong Fang. The cycle, the motorcycle still predominate as the form of, of transport um, on, on the island. And some mountainous scenery near Ling Tao. And finally, yes, I did get a photograph of a steam engine there. Um, the, the problem was this train left just before uh, sunset. So uh, it was a case of trying to uh, get it uh, whilst the, um, there was still enough daylight to see it. Um, I mentioned Taiwan and I've put in a few pictures of Chi Taiwan, but I understand you had a, um, a full talk a few weeks ago on the subject, so I won't dwell too much on, on, it, on Taiwan. Um, Again, it's a, another major earthquake area. It's a junction of a number of the tectonic plates and the mountain terrain reflects the, um, the fact that uh, there have been collisions between a number of these tectonic plates. So this is uh, in Taipei, one of the, uh, the temples. And and another temple. Um, the railway system in Taiwan started with what were known as push carts. So the, uh, the, uh, there were carts that ran on rails and they were pushed by, um, by workmen. Um, and this is a, a, a small museum piece to show what the um, the system was like. It was quite a long, complicated system at one point, and a lot of goods were moved that way, and, and it survived until the 1960s. Quite a, a dominant Buddha statue uh, over shadowing one of the suburbs. And they certainly like their ornate temples. It's very spectacular, both inside and out. As far as the trains go, it's everything from modern um, high-speed trains based on the uh, Japanese Shinkansen, but also uh, local trains still trundling up and down the middle of the street, which um, does appeal to me rather. Um, the middle of the island is quite mountainous and this was a road that was built to link the east and west of the, uh, the island um, through the mountains. As you can see, at places it's quite a tight fit. Now, this is a Chinese typewriter because they've got so many different um, symbols in use. So you, you require a little more ingenuity to find a way of getting everything together. Um, this is the Alishan Forestry Railway. Um, 
originally built to bring uh, logs down from the mountains to the coast. Um, but now um, actually a tourist attraction. And the, the service trains actually work by diesel locomotives, not by these steam engines, because these steam engines run very, very slowly, so um, not used. Um, the Alishan Forestry Railway was the highest railway in Asia, um, getting to a height of 2,682 metres. Um, that was until the Chinese built the line um, to Lhasa in Tibet, which is somewhat higher. That's the sort of scenery um, at sunrise um, up in the mountains of Alishan. The Taiwanese are a very practical people. So here they had a very simple guide as to um, whether you pay an adult fare or a, a child's fare done on the basis of height. And you've got the mark on the, the post so you can check whether you're eligible for one or the other. Um, continuing Westwards um, in, into the Indian Ocean. Here we are in Zanzibar, um, sort of place I always wanted to go just because it was Zanzibar, uh, noted for its uh, cloves, nutmeg, cinnamon, and black pepper. Um, no railway system, although it did at one time have a tram system, which had been closed for many years. Uh, but you can see how the um, the palm tree here has uh, been affected by the uh, the winds. Um, so this is a uh, one of the spices. I th I think it's the cinnamon, but I will be happily corrected on that. Jackfruit. Jackfruit smells awful, but actually tastes very nice. So if you can just not absorb the smell, they're very pleasant. Now, if you're going to harvest the coconuts, they're at the top, so the only way is to climb it. And this is one of the, um, the local uh, tourist guides showing us how it's done. We were then invited to have a go ourselves, we wanted to, but don't think anyone took up the offer. Um, here we are um, in the harbour at sunrise. Um, this is Fort Stone. Uh, the uh, Zanzibar was argued about and fought over by uh, various uh, peoples. And the, the seafront of Stone Town. Um, some of the uh, old town and finally for this section here we have a traditional Dao which still um, ply the uh, east coast of, of Africa um, as trading uh, in spices and, uh, and the like. Um, 